it was a shame to me that I saw so many Americans living paycheck to paycheck. I can't spend time with my family because I have to work. I can't do the things that I love because I got golden handcuffs and I got to do this job. And it just was such a waste, such a dishonor to the fact that I, that we have all survived, right? I mean, we're all, it's all sheer magic that we're all here, you know, and it's so disrespectful to not be living life to the fullest and doing the things you love and spending time with the people you love. So that is my purpose and passion with why I got into wealth management, you know, now 18 years ago. I like the way you put that. Like, I never thought of it that way. If I take my money and go out and do dumb shit with it, in a way, I'm not respecting my family, right? (laughs) Because now I got to go back to work to replace that money. And that's just another uh, bit of time I don't have to spend with my daughters, you know? Yeah. And I I mean, I kind of know that's true. As you say it, I'm like, yeah, duh. But I never really... It never really went in my brain that way, you yeah. know? Yeah, I mean, and, and that's, that's the difference between living a mindful life and living, you know, the social media, con- dopamine addiction, constant mm. distraction, right? You're just, nothing you do is with intention. Mm-hmm. Shit's about to go down. I'm feeling something in my spirit. Chaps and Tats. With Aaron Della Vadova. Hello, friends, neighbors, lovers of art. Welcome back to Chats and Tats with me, your host, Aaron Della Vadova. Before I start today, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, filled with love and gratitude, thank you to everybody that has been watching the show and, and, and sending me these little DM love notes, man. I, I can't tell you how much that means to me. This is a big effort for me to, to put this thing together. And every time you guys do that, it just fills my tank. So thank you for all of you supporting me that are supporting me. And, and uh, if you want to add an extra like or another subscription, it helps me tremendously. Please do so. Today's guest is a little off our beaten track. Maybe, maybe not. But I got to know her through her husband who was on our show. Fell in love with the man, one of the most amazing human beings I've ever met. I'll drop his name here in a minute. But uh, got to meet his beautiful wife and got to know her story. And the story she told me of her life is profound. It's a a story of overcoming horrendous obstacles and finding light and love and forgiveness and compassion through that. So that's mainly, and then what she's done with her life today, absolutely beautiful and amazing. We work together now currently, and we'll get into that as well. So I won't keep you hanging any longer. With all that being said, I'm going to let her put it in her words, all the stuff that went down. Please welcome my guest today, Sathya Shea Patterson. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's, I I already said it, but Landon Patterson, everybody, that's the episodes. There's been two um, with Landon, who, if you listen to the show, you know, is a Somali. I mean, he's a lot of things, but he's a Somali. We tattooed him on the show and we became fast friends. And then, of course, you come along and I'm just like, wow. And of course, it didn't shock me to meet how, uh, find out how amazing you are after knowing yeah. what I've learned about Landon. So it's just a beautiful thing. And I'm not going to say what we, how we work together yet, because we're going to get to that. And now not only are we good friends, but we are working together, which is awesome as well. But I think I would like to start off with, you know, your childhood and, uh, and maybe, maybe even, I don't know, I want to say educate, because when I heard Sathya's story, I will admit I was obliquely aware of this, um, but this thing that had happened, but I didn't really know a whole lot about it. And the more I kind of did a little deep dive on it, I'm like, my God, I, I can't believe this isn't like national news every day, like that this occurred on our planet. And I know it's happened in other places, but this is a big one. But I won't even say what it is. You tell us what what went down. Where were you born and what happened? Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I was born in a refugee camp in Thailand, in Chunburi, Thailand. And that we ended up there. My family ended up there because we all survived, my immediate family at least, survived the Cambodian genocide that occurred from 75 to 79. And... We lived in refugee camps for about four years because it took time. You know, it was this lottery process to come to a country that was accepting refugees, war-torn countries mm. like France, Canada, and the U.S. And then- so can I back you up there? So just to back you up a little bit, this uh, genocide was, um, was created or enforced by the Khmer Rouge. Khmer Rouge. Khmer Rouge. I always yeah. said Khmer. Khmer Rouge. 
and the leader of which being Pol Pot. Right. And the goal, if I understand this correctly, he was trying to create some kind of socialist utopia. Right. But in doing so, he had to get rid of anybody who was associated with the old government. He had to get rid of anybody yeah. who even questioned what the fuck he was doing. And it resulted in 1.5 estimate to possibly 2 million deaths. It's more like two and a half million people. Okay. So, you know, I was, I've talked to my parents about this so I've, because they lived it, right? My father, he says maybe 50% of his family perished in, in, during this time period. And he, he says probably 50 to 70% of the men he grew up with passed away. You know, there was a civil war raging in Cambodia right after the Vietnam War. You know, the Viet Cong trying to gain power over the area and whatnot. Um, my dad was served in the army, in the Cambodian army. His father was killed during the Khmer Rouge rule. But, you know, there, so there's a civil war going on. You know, my, my, my father's home was bombed. He then um, was captured by the Khmer Rouge to join them. This is before 1975. And he said, you know what? I, I don't want to be in the army. I'm going to go be a monk. So, and they allowed him to do that. So he lived at a temple and studied to be a monk for a couple years until that temple was bombed by Southern Vietnam forces trying to get the Khmer Rouge and the Viet Cong from overtaking the country. Um, of 50 people that were living there, he and one other survived Whoa. the bombing of that temple. It was completely leveled. Wow. So there goes my dad's first survival story, mm. you know, and then he moves to Phnom Penh, where uh, the capital of Cambodia, where he's trying to go to work and, 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 you know, go to school and whatnot. But he ends up joining the Cambodian army, serves there for about five years before the Khmer Rouge take over. He tells me the day, you know, when the Khmer Rouge took over, his general said, you know, we've lost. There's no more fighting. He said he literally took off his army fatigues and his rifle, laid it in the river, and went looking for clothes to put on so that he can now hide as a civilian. Mm. My father luckily studied enough of the Communist Party and their beliefs that he knew he had to play like he was a, a commoner, mm -hmm. uneducated, and that was how he survived, where his, as his father... Because so many of the Khmer Rouge soldiers were his students, my, fa my grandfather was a, a teacher, a professor. And because so many of his students became Khmer Rouge soldiers, one day he was working in the fields and they came to call him and he never came back. You know, you were told to go see Anka. Anka was the government, the leader. Mm -hmm. Like every, you know, and they called you, they called him by name and they never saw him again. Because he was a professor, because he was- We don't ever know why, but that's likely it. Every, mm. Anyone who wore glasses, who was educated, who was in the army, like you said, mm. was killed. Now, my, unless you were intelligent enough to just play that you were an idiot. My right. dad said, you know, I'm a student. I don't know anything. You know, you don't talk to anyone. You don't talk amongst each other. You can't trust anybody. You know, that's how my father survived. And my mother survived because she was- a seamstress, so she had a skill, mm -hmm. and she sewed for the soldiers. She repaired their backpacks and made, you know, you know, repaired their uniforms made and whatnot. Made useful. At this time that the Khmer Rouge came in, my parents weren't together. They had, they were both in separate uh, marriages. My mother was married, her husband at the time, and she had three children. So my mother is, you know, in her late teens, 18, 19, and her sister was in the middle of getting a blood transfusion. I believe she had leukemia in the hospital, but the hospitals were emptied, right? The Khmer Rouge came in, said, everyone grab your things, take what you can carry and walk into the rural areas where you will all become a part of this agrarian society. And so the hospitals were empty. My mom tells me the story of how she went into the hospital, unplugged all the blood transfusion equipment and took her little sister in a uh, cart and pushed her into the fields and they walked for a month until her sister passed away right in front of her oh, and she had to bury her along the road. Wow. And my mom at that time was a young mother. She had my three siblings. She had a three-year-old daughter, a two-year-old daughter, and then uh, like a 12-month-old son. Wow. And all the while she's carrying these children and her husband at the time. Um, and then, you know, a couple years into the war, her husband was so exhausted 
you know, and she stayed home to care of the kids. The kids were too young at that time. The children were not able to work in the fields until they were at least five years old. So my siblings, thankfully, had to, were at home at that time. But her husband kept telling her, I, I need to leave. I'm starving. We're working for 15 hours a day. I can't take this anymore. My mom said, where would we go? They, these are jungle, you know, they, they, they fought in the jungles. They know they're all around us. And she said one day she woke up at, you know, three in the morning and saw that he packed a knapsack. And she said, I was just tired of talking him out of it. He just bailed. And she went to sleep. And the next day she never saw him again. And, you know, there was rumors that he left with a friend and that friend was never seen again. Most likely didn't make it. Most likely didn't make it. Because after the war, you came back to your homelands, you know, to your hometown and tried to find your parents. And, you know, that's how you reunited with family after whoever survived. But he never came back mm. while his mother and siblings were still mm. around. So that's why we think he never survived. Well, he probably would have come back. So right. my mom now has become a single mother in the middle of this um, communist rule and genocide taking place. My sisters are now five and four, and they go get taken and are put into child labor camps. Wow. And my mother is separated from her children for the next three years. You're allowed to go visit your family one day a week. The children, you know, are, are let go for a couple hours from work to go visit their parents and things like that. But my mom, you know, thankfully they survived all of that. And there's a great movie that Angelina Jolie directed called First They Killed My Father based on a book written by a survivor of the Khmer Rouge. And it it talks, it, it's almost like my sister's story, who my oldest sister is in her mid-50s now, was the five-year-old little girl who lived in the child labor camps. But she remembers the bombing um, that the South, South Vietnamese and Americans did over Cambodia when they ultimately chased the Khmer Rouge out in 1979, where she could just see bodies exploding all around her and she's running through these fields to go back to where she knew my grandma because they separated everyone by age mm. where she was so you know my parents my father and mother didn't meet until after the war and my there was a temporary government that was put into place my father worked with my mother's brother and that's how they met mm -hmm. we saw that the prime minister coming into power and kind of the government that was being put into place after the Khmer Rouge just wasn't going to be a place where we wanted, they wanted to continue growing their family. Um, so one day my parents took what they could carry again mm -hmm. and got on a train and went to the Thai border to refugee camps there because they knew they didn't want to stay in Cambodia, even though the Khmer Rouge were gone. And then we stayed in refugee camps for four years and that's where I was born. Ooh, I gotta just take a deep breath after I, that. That was a lot. <laughs> no, it is. It's it's just um, I don't know. I'm just reflecting on on myself and in this Western life we all live, and yeah, how how um how easy we have it. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it just makes excuses so much less meaningful in our current. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're going to agree with me on all of this when you hear yeah. somebody like, "Oh, life's been beating me down, man." You know, the jobs suck, the pay sucks, and I can't get, it's like, well, you hear this story and you're like. I mean, <laughs> if your father was killed and you could even mourn him, you couldn't even, my father couldn't show any emotion, mm -hmm. you know? Wow. That's, that's powerful. And, um, let me, oh, I just had this. So what happened to Pol Pot? He actually died in his sleep. I want to say. I hope it'd be late. something a little more. I gruesome. know, so exactly. No, nope. <laughs> or at least put to trial, or uh, you know, yeah, I, his his peers were put to trial, but no, nothing happened to him. He ended mm. up living a, I did believe, a, people, a somewhat comfortable life until his death. Did a lot of people that were involved in this genocide go to trial and and actually was there justice uh, on, on some level? I, I no, no, no. They were just kind of not really. Like, I mean, there were some people put to trial, but not really. Not really. I mean, and so, you know, there's quotes between one and a half to two million people to two and a half million people that died at this time. That was something around 25 to 35 percent of the population died at that time. But my dad says, oh, those are just numbers. Those, those are bodies they could count. Well, what about all the bodies that they never found? He, he thinks it's more like 50 percent of the population because he said if he looked at his own family, only 50 percent survived. He was telling me about one engineer, you know, that was a survivor. His entire family died. His 
mom, his dad, his children, his wife, he was the only survivor in his family. Ah, so, so yeah. amazing what humans can do. <laughs> uh, I don't say amazing in a good way, but it just, it's, it's mind boggling to think of, uh, yeah. you know, I look at um, evil people. I would call that evil. And I just think that was a little baby. And I've seen, there is no evil babies. Where do you go from that? Born they, beautiful and perfect to killing 2.5 million people. And they killed babies because they knew if they killed the parents that the babies would want to grow up to want to seek revenge. So they killed children and babies. So it's just, it is mind blowing. But, you know, when we, you know, I know that you're a, a forever learner about and trying to become enlightened or continue on that journey. I'm a seeker. I'm a seeker. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and and it's it's so um it's so scary what ignorant and um unenlightened people can achieve. Yeah. Because I think you you forget that we're all we come all come from the same place. Yeah. And you know they say once you see that we're all the same, how can you hurt yourself? You know. Especially when you're talking about a country that is primarily Buddhist. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, Pol Pot, I'm assuming, was exposed to Buddhism. Like, dude, what do you think is going to happen if this whole Buddhism thing is true? You know, this reincarnation thing, this karma thing, you know? Yeah. That's the thing I always flabbergasts me about some of the powerful people in our world that make choices that result in this type of chaos. You know, the reality is nobody knows what happens after we die. I mean, mm -hmm. you, can, you can have faith. I have my own faith in something and you can have that faith, but really nobody knows. And these, and these people, I wouldn't call them unintelligent. So I look at them and I'm thinking, man, you're, you're willing to risk that. Like, cause if it's the Christian version, you're going to fucking hell. Yeah. And if, I've read about what they do down there. That's like eternal hell, eternity. Yeah. It's just terrifying to think of uh, the Buddhist. You're going to be reincarnated with this type of karma. You're going to have a, thousands of years of, of very uncomfortable lives, all these things. And they're just out there pulling these triggers, like seemingly, you know, that's where I think you, I guess for me, it's like sociopath comes to mind, like mm -hmm. something, something's wrong with them, obviously. Yeah. To take a risk of that level for power and money or whatever they're after. Yeah. Crazy to me. I, well, mean, I, I mean, I would understand a couple people have done it maybe over, over a thousand years, but there's a lot of people that do it. <laughs> Just it's like, happening in the world every day. Yeah. You know, when people say, God, I never heard about the Khmer Rouge and the Cambodian genocide. It's happening every day. Yeah. It, it's still happening, you yeah. know, but it, for, for the Khmer Rouge, at least for me to be in America, for me to have parents and siblings who worked in child labor, you know, <laughs> Landon's Jewish. So we always sick, twisted joke that we're bonded by genocide. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, we, but it, you know, the, the what happened during the, some truth to that though. <laughs> so there is, there yeah. is, but the, the Holocaust happened so many generations ago, right? Most of those who survived that aren't alive anymore. Oh. Whereas I can talk to my parents and, and, and I'm so energetically and karma and generational trauma, all those things are so still Mm -hmm. you know, alive. And this is and, recent. We're talking, talking, it ended in 79. Yeah. That's, yeah. let's just say 80. Yeah. 80 just feel like that's like not yeah. too long ago, man. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let me, let me, let me, before we move too far forward. So you're now living or being raised in a refugee camp and you mm -hmm. were there for how many years? We were there for four years. So you were four years old when you left. No, I, I, I was born you at were, the tail oh, end sorry. of that. So I, I was a year old when I came to America. I was oh, a year old. Oh, I yeah. see. I see. So I, I thankfully don't, you don't remember, remember I see, I see. that time. I, we I see pictures going. of myself in the camp, but but no, I don't remember that. You know, my memories come when we're in America, right? And at this time, my parents come to this country. They have nothing. You know, we weren't sponsored by a family like a lot of church families sponsored, let you live in their home and things. Uh, but we had family here already mm -hmm. that we were able to come live with. You you needed to have somewhere to go, of course, but we didn't have any money, and so. My parents did little things like go, um, you know, my my siblings were in middle and high school at this time, middle school. So every morning around 3, 4 a.m., they'd all get up, everyone, including the baby. They brought me in a, you know, car seat. And we went to trash cans outside of grocery stores where we took cardboard and cans and 
recycled those for money, for mm. food. We took dented cans out of the grocery store, trash cans and expired produce and meats to make our dinners with, right? Because mm. they threw things away that were past and, expiration and just real date, quick for reference, edible. where are you? In America? In Long Beach. Oh, in Long Beach, Long Beach okay. has the largest population of Cambodians outside of Cambodia. Oh, so that's that. where we came. Okay. Wow. Okay. So this is how you're living in yeah. America. Yeah. And probably grateful to be living like that because no one's going to most likely put a yeah. gun to your head and kill you at least. Right? I always say my, I love country music and my parents are like, uh, people are like, how the hell did you start liking country music? I said, my dad was so proud to be an American. Mm -hmm. He said, what's American? Country music? I'm all, give me more of that Garth Brooks, you know? <laughs> so I, I grew up listening to country music. That's yes. how that's how proud he was to be here. That's cool. You know, and there's such a raging debate. I don't want to get into it about, you know, our immigration policies, but this is what I love about immigrants is that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you want to find a fucking proud American. And I know there's people born here who are just as proud. You can, I would say, I would guess the percentage of people that come from situations like that are probably prouder Americans than your average kid who's born here. Right. You know, who wants to go burn the flag with his, with his buddies because he's pissed off about uh, something, you know? Yeah. I, I don't want to shit on the Americans that are here and, and their lack of love for this country because I, I love this country and I have, mo you know, the people I hang out with do too. But it does sadden me to see so many people, and I would call it ignorance, that um, they want to just bitch and whine and shit on America and tell you how shitty it is. And I think it's just a, a, laugh, a lack of understanding like what goes on out there in the real world and why America is still the greatest country in the world. Absolutely. You know, but that's ignorance, right? Maybe. So this Long Beach lifestyle you're living. <laughs> yeah. LBC. L LBC. Um, how, this goes, obviously doesn't go on forever. No. You know, your, your parents, this is how you're getting by in your younger years. How many years does this go on before you start establishing your family? I mean, you know, this is what takes me on my finance path is a lot of these things I saw, you know, lived out for me and that my parents, you know, they recycled cardboard. They, we wore clothes from Goodwill. I never bought things for myself until I was in middle school. Everything else was hand-me-downs or used. But that my mom bought a sewing machine. She saved up for a sewing machine. She brought that skill back of being able to sew, started sewing clothes by the pound, saved up money from that, borrowed money from friends, opened up one of the first Cambodian supermarkets in Long Beach. From that, they opened a, a liquor store and from that opened another store. So that then their kids took over, right? Mm -hmm. So slowly through just no handouts. My dad was very proud. He didn't want to be on government assistance for long. We weren't on welfare for years or anything like that. You know, we lived in a two bedroom apartment with seven people. So my, my parents, I, I forgot to tell you that in Cambodia, in the refugee camps, my parents in their, you know, they're in their mid twenties at this time, they have five kids. They're also taking care of my mom's younger sister and brothers. So that's seven. Then my uncle left his children behind so three children behind. So my parents, why it took us so long to get out of the refugee camps is because my parents had 10 people mm. to take care of, you know, um, in addition to themselves. So it was really hard. It's harder to take a family of 12 right. out rather than a family of four, you know? And so we come to this country and now, you know, my, my uncle takes his three kids back, but it's now my my parents, seven, plus my younger aunt and uncle, nine, we're living in a two-bedroom apartment and we rent one of the rooms out. Oh, my God. You know? Okay. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's how they're able to get by. You know, we have a piece of chicken. We're splitting it 10 ways, you know? Mm -hmm. That's how we're able to get by. And eventually they build a small empire, but an empire that allows them to retire in their 50s. Wow. You know, they own real estate. They have savings. They own gold, which is one of uh, Asian, most Southeast Asians' uh, main um, investment vehicle, uh, gold and diamonds. And, um, but they, they were able to build a comfortable life uh, for themselves. Retired in their 50s. Retired in their 50s. All right. Anybody listening out yeah. there that, that says that uh, the world's against them and the odds are stacked against them, just, just soak on that for a second. A lot of opportunity out there, friends. You know? Man, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. And, I, and I'm going to tie this into why I work with you now. Like mm -hmm. you have the fucking resume. And I'll just say this, I guess, just, you know, you're, you're, you own a wealth advising company, Arise Private Wealth. You're a yeah. wealth advisor. And that's how we work together, people. She's trying to 
you know, help me because I am a kind of a dumb, spoiled American who hasn't <laughs> hasn't saved his money probably as good as he should have. So I'm glad you're in my life. But before we get to, and I just, I guess I just wanted to highlight, like, if you, if you got somebody helping you with your money, that's the resume I want to hear. Okay. That is as, about as good as it can possibly get. If you you understand um, the uh, value of saving and conserving probably deeper than probably anyone I've ever met. So that's incredible. But before we get there, mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about trauma because obviously there's a lot of trauma going on here, mm -hmm. inevitably. You ever heard of the term epigenetics? Yes. Of course. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's that layer to it too. Like the idea, and for people who might not know what that is, uh, the idea, and correct me if I'm wrong, epigenetics is the trauma of, of, of your parents comes through in your genetics when they have a child. So there's that, plus you growing up your own trauma of what you actually experienced, you know, digging through trash cans to find enough money to get by, probably feeling less than you go to school and the other kids are coming in their cool clothes and you've got some shit your mom sewed together and being teased or you know, absolutely I layers and layers. The and heart and the height of Cambodian gangs in Long Beach. You know, I have, I can go to a, cemetery and visit too many friends you know so mm. there's that whole trauma because a lot of of the children that came to long beach were now being tormented by mexican gangs you know just so they banded together and created you know some of really big gangs in long beach mm. um with a lot of gang wars so there was a lot of that going on in, in with me growing up too wow a lot of trauma what have you done for that, like what, what is your, you know, how did you heal? My parents, which I think, you know, your, one, your, your other podcast guest, um, Tom was talking about like his family was workaholics. Well, when you're an immigrant and you're literally have no other choice, but to have multiple jobs and be gone all day to put food on the table, there were unintentional workaholics as well, you mm -hmm. know? And what does a, a child doesn't, you're not able to rationalize that acts of service that your my parents are gone all day because they love me so much and they work so hard mm -hmm. because they want to put food on the table. A child only knows love through affection mm -hmm. and those words of affirmation and encouragement. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have that either, you know? And so there was that trauma of abandonment there. How did I heal that? Well, I felt that as I was becoming an adult, entering into relationships, my relationships were with unhealthy people. I was ending up brokenhearted or just I became a mother at 21, single mother at 25. That relationship didn't work out. And then I, I didn't really meet Landon until I was in my late 30s, mm -hmm. you know. And so along that way, I made the wrong choices and partners constantly. Mm -hmm. And I think the self-awareness and the spiritual growth and the healing came when I had to ask myself, it's not everyone else and my circumstance why I end up like this. There must be something I'm doing. There must be something I'm choosing. And why am I doing that? And that's what led me on that spiritual growth of finding out what about my childhood? What about the trauma that my family has been through is causing me to, in essence, and I think a lot of this is the core of what, why people make poor decisions is lack of self-love, lack of self-worth. You know, when you feel abandoned by your parents, you always feel a child thinks there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. That's why they don't love me enough to spend time with me. And then you transform that into an adult. All of a sudden, you always think you're the reason why you're unlovable. And mm -hmm. you choose people that don't love you and don't show up for you. So, they, so that you can be right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? We all get to be right in the end. What Landon, do you want to be right about? <laughs> Landon laughs that I always quote um, Charles Cooley, this 19th century uh, sociologist who developed this looking glass theory. And he says, I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am, right? In that we develop our sense of self-worth based on how we think other people view us. Okay. So he's not saying the enlightened statement. He's saying how most people are operating. How most people are operating. Right. Okay, because when you said that, I was like, that's not the enlightened. I get it. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. But that's, I think that's how most people are operating. We're always trying to live, present ourselves as the people we want other people to perceive us as. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're always trying to prove ourselves to be worthy to some other, someone else's view mm -hmm. of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I started healing the trauma of my childhood and, and, and my family history by doing the spiritual work to 
learn to love myself, Mm -hmm. learn to be proud of the things I've accomplished and how far I've come, right? Instead of always having that feeling of restlessness and distracting myself with achievements Mm -hmm. because I think it will make me worthier to someone else. And that work specifically, what are we talking? Uh, Are we talking uh, meditation? Are we talking therapy with therapists or... What were you doing? What was the most impactful thing that you did? It started with as yoga. It just started yeah. with yoga. Yoga led me into mindfulness, breath work, mm-hmm. meditation. I've worked with some plant medicine mm-hmm. and worked with the curandera, mm-hmm. sought spiritual coaches and my own reading. But I think my greatest learning is the meditation, time with yourself, reflection, you know, we're always looking for answers outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have just as much, you know yourself better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think where I'm at in my life is spending more time in meditation and self-reflection so I can find the knowledge within myself of Mm -hmm. what I need, you know? And when we feel that sense of abandonment and we're always looking for that mother or father we never had, you know, it's time to be your own divine mother and father. Mm You know, one of my spiritual mentors um, does a great exercise that I recommend people do that deal with childhood trauma is taking a childhood picture of yourself Mm. and looking at that picture every day and telling that child, I love you. You're perfect. I'm here to protect you. You don't need to be scared anymore. You know, it's time to be your own mother and father. It's funny you say that, you know, every time I've ever done, not every time, most of the times when I've done a large dose of mushrooms, I end up talking to this me as a little boy. And it's, and uh, I usually cry, you know, he usually shows up saying things like, why don't you play with me anymore? Like, why, when did you get so serious? Like, what happened? I'm still here. Like, why aren't we climbing trees? Why aren't we? enjoy why aren't we living childlike being explorative and all these yeah. things and why you know and uh it's 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 so plant medicine i mean it's done a lot for me too but um that's it's interesting how that inner child will show up and you know that meditation of looking and talking to that inner child and yeah. saying what you said you know i'm here i love you i you know and creating a it's almost as if it truly exists, you know, and, and that gets into fractal time and stuff. But I mean, there's a lot of philosophies out there that say it is. It's all happening yeah. simultaneously. Your five-year-old self exists. And what you're doing as your 50-year-old self is affecting the five-year-old and all of it's intertwined. It's beautiful. Yeah. And, and plant medicine has become very, very popular. And I do think it's your fast track to that space where God lives, but it can totally be achieved through meditation and breath work because you don't need, you don't need any assistance Mm. to get to the heart of who you are. No. You know, but it's, it's hard, right? Why is Ozempic so popular in America? You know, Mm. because you can take a pill and lose the weight or you can exercise daily for three months. No one wants to do that. Yeah. You could do plant medicine and enter into that space and get that enlightenment. But, oh my gosh, how many people I know that do plant medicine every month, four years, mm-hmm. and they're still, they reach those point of enlightenment and then they go back into the real world and they don't follow through with those practices. Yeah. So I, that's definitely a word of caution that people think it's, it can solve everything. Yeah. No, and I agree hundred percent. I think the beauty of plant medicine is you get to see and touch mm-hmm. that space. Yeah. Then you can, what it did for me is now I, I can identify it. Mm-hmm. And now I know what I'm seeking. Yeah. It's easier to find something when you know what it looks like. Right. No, absolutely. You know? and, absolutely. But, but I, agree. I 100% agree with you. My my um, usage of of different hallucinogenics um, is waning over the years. I barely do it anymore. But yeah, I, 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 I agree. It's not, not necessary. You know, I have a buddy who smoked DMT when I was hanging out with him probably a hundred times and he'd still walk in the you know, walk in a door and be like screaming about traffic, like it's fucking motherfucker, like this yeah. violent. It's like, dude, this DMT ain't held it. You're like, <laughs> yeah. come on, man. So agreed. But I do think it's a good, the popularity of it, I think is, is it can't hurt. Right. When you're dealing right. with, um, especially in the West where we are godless to some degree, you know, for it to just be, and it's out there, boy, it is 
on wildfire right now. And I think that's yeah. a great thing. And yeah. you're right. Some people are going to do the work after they've seen this thing. Like, wow, that's where I need to go. And then I'll, well, I'll meditation and breath work and sound healing, all these things. And we'll get into the work you do in the sound healing arena here in a second. But before we get there, we kind of talked about trauma and what you've done. It's really cool that you did it yourself, sort of, which is in the end what everybody has to do. That's another trap, right? The counselor will fix me. The therapist will fix yeah. me. No, they, they can only show you some stuff and then you still got to do it, you know? Absolutely. It's like, I'm going to go watch people lift weights and get strong. No, you have to lift the weights, you know? But let's get a little into forgiveness. Mm -hmm. How did you wrestle with that one? I mean, you certainly have the right to be pretty angry about what happened to your family. But I mean, I personally believe when you hold, and I know you're going to agree because I yeah. can tell you've done the work. But when you hold on to resentment and when you hold on to anger, it's a frequency that lives inside you. And then you attract situations that justify that happening again. So you can be angry at your boss. You can be upset with your whoever else you've brought into your life. You know, so this just makes it worse. So for really to move ahead in life, you really got to forgive anyone who's ever hurt you. Mm -hmm. So, and I have my philosophy on how I was able to do that and how I see it, but I want to hear how you view that forgiveness. I always tell myself hatred and resentment is like drinking poison and expecting your enemy to die. <laughs> I've heard that. That's good. That's a great reminder. Forgiveness for me, for my parents, why, you know, I fell in love as a child for everything that happened to my family during that time is see, ha give, having compassion for those people, you know, when I think, oh, my parents didn't love me and they were always gone and, you know, they always had these high expectations of me. I have to have compassion for them that they did the best that they could, mm -hmm. that they loved me and that they made the best choices that they could, you know. And I think there were so many Khmer Rouge soldiers that were children mm -hmm. that were killing people and they were just trying to survive themselves, you know. So I think you have to just have compassion for people. All the way up to Pol Pot. All the way up to Pol Pot. He thought he was doing the right thing. Yeah. They always do, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think there's so many things that are happening in the world. You have hurt someone. I have hurt someone. Mm -hmm. And I had may have had the best intentions. You know, and I and as as although, you know, killing millions of people is way worse than me, uh, I don't know flaking on my friend, um, <laughs> maybe it's, it's, you have to look at it in the same way that, that you have to have compete compassion for people. I think that's, that's my key to being able to forgive. Yeah. Agreed. I said this before we started the show, but when I'm struggling with forgiveness towards somebody that's hurt me, I often picture them as a child. Mm -hmm. I just see that person when they were little. And then I, from there, it's just like, Things happened to them and they got confused along the way. And in their confusion, they're hurting people now. Yeah. And then uh, forgiveness and compassion, that feeling of forgiveness. And, well, compassion is what the feeling of compassion is what comes in. And through that, forgiveness naturally occurs. Yeah. Well, when you have love in your heart, hatred has a hard time. It's not the environment it wants to thrive in. You know, you had Miguel Ruiz's son on your podcast yeah. and one of his you know, four agreements is don't take it personal. Mm. You know, often the hatred comes from and the resentment comes from this happened to me mm. and they did this to me because there's something wrong with me or whatever. You take it personal. And I, I really try, whenever someone wrongs me, I really remind myself that sometimes it may not have to do anything with me, but I got hurt along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, good. I mean, I know, I know just knowing you that you've you found this forgiveness. You found this compassion for those that have hurt you. And in turn, you found compassion and forgiveness for yourself, which is ultimately where this goes, right? right. I mean, that's the final step, right? Because we've all hurt somebody and we've all done things that we regret. And, and you, you, to find peace in your heart, to say to yourself when you look in the mirror, I, I, was, I didn't know any better. I know better now. And mm -hmm. you change. And in that moment, you forgive, right? You forgive yourself. And as you go through this process, the, your self-love increases, right? And then maybe, maybe if you're lucky, you get to the point where when you look in that mirror, you literally can just go, you're, you're rad. You're yeah. a good person. And then in that knowing, in that feeling of feeling that way about yourself, reality seems to conform to that. So what do good people have? 
Good people have beautiful relationships. Good people have friends. Good people have wealth. Good people get all the good stuff about life. But and you've got to get to the point where you tr- you can't lie about this either. You know, you it, you have to mean it. And I think for me, that's the work, right? And if you find that part of yourself that you can't seem to get over, that's where the work lies. That's the yeah. thing you've got to... That's my low point where I had to change and seek spiritual work, especially because I knew I wanted a partner in my life and I, and I wouldn't have met Landon. Landon and I both say we wouldn't have liked each other, mm-hmm. you know, had we have not gone on our own spiritual paths, you know, and when we have, I have so many friends that are in their forties and either divorced or single. And they say, I can't find any, you know, it's, I really, it's, you know, all the dating apps and, you know, all the guys or whatever the excuses are, you know, I, I think it's the self work that led me to find and to bring that person into my life, to bring Landon into my life. You attract what you are. Yeah. You know, and yeah, if you would have stayed in your old mindset, you would have attracted another um, person that would have treated you exactly how you expected a person to be treated of that frequency. Right. You know, I'm not worth it. I'm not worthy. Oh, great. I'll date this guy because he'll treat me accordingly. Yeah. No, but you had gotten through that. I know Landon has done his own work. Exactly. And yeah. uh, and you're right. You guys met at the perfect time when you both yeah. were ready for that, you know? Yeah. It's beautiful. Definitely the universe brings And now people. it should be said, you guys have a, a beautiful baby boy, Zion. Yeah. 10 months old. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank oh, that's you. awesome. So you're a single mom. You know you've got to you've got to create money. You got to raise a family. So take us through that part. You haven't maybe done all your healing yet, but you're still working your ass off. So what did you do on that? No, front? I mean I wasn't on my spiritual journey until I was in my late twenties. So at this time that I'm a young mother, I mean I'm just surviving. I was in a bad relationship. We were on different paths, and you know at 21 I was lost soul up until that point. I mean that's how you end up pregnant at 20, right? Um, I I was a lost soul at that point, but this is about healing trauma through being a parent. This story that that transpires is, I don't know what changed in me when I became pregnant, but once I held her, I knew I wanted to give her a different life. I knew I wanted to show her I loved her. I, I knew that I wanted to give her all the things that I didn't have as a child. You know, my little girl me, saw in her everything that I wanted and and yearned for. So my path was immediately, I need to provide for this child a, a good home, you know, a safe place, the money to do the things that she wanted to do. You know, I couldn't play sports or anything because we didn't have health care. You know, we didn't have health insurance. Um, so I made sure to do, to get a good job and, and, and have health care and things like that for her. I made sure to always respect her even as a you know two year old, what do you want to do? Let's spend time on your level instead of saying you always have to f- fall in line with me. Because that growing up when we're poor, it's like I just had to follow along with everyone else is doing. There wasn't time for play. There wasn't time for what I wanted. Mm. I went back to school when she was three months old, so I had to drop out of. Co- I was in university at the time that I got pregnant. Dropped out of university to to have her. Went back to school when she was three months old. Finished and got my finance degree at Cal State Fullerton. And as I was finding out what would I love to do, you know, it was it seemed very natural to me that I saw my parents build a, a wealthy life, and wealth is the life, the ability to fully experience life and do everything you want and have the freedom to have what you want, that kind of wealthy, by living within their means, saving, investing wisely. And I found wealth management Mm -hmm. because my parents didn't invest in Bitcoin or um, find some hot stock tip. That's how they tripled their money. No, you know, they did it the old fashioned way. And I think that with you know, the Reddit and, and the meme stocks and, and Bitcoin, every, and all the ways that you can't, that you've heard of people tripling their money, you know, you get caught up in that, um, that you need some get rich quick scheme. And actually you can build wealth through hard work, s- investing wisely, living within your means. You know, my parents retired in their fifties, but they couldn't do that if they were spending half a million dollars a year, right? They, they live within their means and that's why they were able to build the life they have. So I wanted to help people create the life of their dreams. I feel so fortunate to be alive that it was a shame to me that I saw so many Americans living paycheck to paycheck. 
I can't spend time with my family because I have to work. I can't do the things that I love because I got golden handcuffs and I got to do this job. And it just was such a waste, such a dishonor to the fact that I, that we have all survived, right? I mean, we're all, it's all sheer magic that we're all here, you know, and it's so disrespectful to not be living life to the fullest and doing the things you love and spending time with the people you love. So that is my purpose and passion with why I got into wealth management, you know, now 18 years ago. I like the way you put that. Like, I never thought of it that way. If I take my money and go out and do dumb shit with it, in a way, I'm not respecting my family, right? <laughs> because now I got to go back to work to replace that money. And that's just another uh, bit of time I don't have to spend with my daughters, you know? Yeah. And I, I mean, I kind of know that's true. As you say it, I'm like, yeah, duh. But I never right. really... It never really went in my brain that way, you know? Yeah, I mean, and, and that's, that's the difference between living a mindful life and living, you know, the social media, con dopamine addiction, constant mm. distraction, right? You're just, nothing you do is with intention, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it doesn't have to be a stressful thing. You know, I work a lot with women um, who have just less of a, a, a comfortable relationship with money. So then they avoid it. They avoid those conversations, but avoidance will lead you. It's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And it doesn't have to have that negative emotion with it. I had a, a guy on the show by the name of Ryan Roy. He's actually a wealth advisor, kind of specifically for tattoo artists, but I think he's branching out to other creatives. S young guy, but smart. He had a quote though I loved. I want to read it to you. He said, Instead of asking, how do I make more money? Instead, ask, who do I need to unbecome to allow more money into my life? Mm. Isn't that powerful? That's unbecome. very powerful. I love that. You know, because uh, let's get practical with that. Unbecome, unbecome. Maybe I need to be less addicted to dopamine. Maybe I need to acknowledge the fact that something must be missing in my life because the only way I can sort of feel good is to go on Amazon.com and buy a toy, right? A toy mm. that I don't need, you know? Like that would be one small example of unbecoming that. And what, what, what do you have to do to do that? Well, you have to address the fact that you must not be meditating enough or being centered enough or being intentional. Something, you're not doing something if the way you get your kick every day is to buy something on Amazon, right? Yeah. So I thought that was a powerful statement. I love that. I mean, I, I, I practice that in a way every day of my life when I want to eat healthier. It's when I want to go and eat something unhealthy or spend money on something stupid, it's what would a what would a healthy person who loved their body, what would they choose? What would someone who's smart with their money, what would they choose? You know, and often that addiction to those things, to drugs, to the dopamine, it's, it's just a breath. It's a pause and awareness. And it passes. And it passes. <laughs> so absolutely, I, I definitely agree with, with his statement. So this is interesting. So this, yeah, you're, you're a wealth advisor, but you're, you're really bringing a, a lot of spiritual teaching into the way you work with people. That's, yeah. that's cool. You know, I've talked to a yeah. few, I've had, you're not the first person I've worked with, um, with money, but you're my favorite so far, <laughs> but none of the others I'd worked with before ever really spoke this way. It was very practical. It was, let me see your budget. This is going yeah. here and that's going there. And then, we, you know, we tried to do it and but you're teaching a philosophy to these people. You're changing their mind, which changes their habits, which changes the outcome. Absolutely. You know, it's what is the life you want to create? What does what your life look like, your ideal life look like? And then now I can't make you fit into this box of like, follow this budget and save this much every, you know, that would be, you know, a futile exercise because you would never follow it, right? Mm -hmm. I have to always be creating a custom plan that aligns with the life that my clients want to create. And, and then I do all the busy, boring shit in the background that you don't want to deal with, right? Um, on the bank, open the account, <laughs> yeah, exactly. sign this form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of boring, tedious things that I, I do. But, you know, my first goal is to get to know my clients on a deep level, understand what, what their goals are, and then what obstacles, what do, what they need to unbecome <laughs> and how I can unconsciously help them do that, right? Because we never want to do things consciously, right? I right. have to learn to weave that, their goals yeah. into their habits. Yeah, yeah. Every person's probably different. Yeah. Some people need to be told what to do sternly. Some people need suggestions. Other people need 
hints of advice. I, I yeah. mean, yeah, that's a very dynamic way of handling your job. It sounds a bit kind of overwhelming. I mean, you're, you're kind of a counselor yeah. for not just people, but probably a lot of times marriages. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of people who think differently about their money than their spouse does. And that's a constant source of conflict. Mm -hmm. You know, money is the number one reason for divorce. So absolutely, when I get to a spouse, two partners together, there's some therapy going yeah. there as yeah. well. Yeah. That, uh, but you must enjoy it. I do because it's part of my life's purpose. Yeah. You know, it's it's hard. Yeah, I always tell people my job is amazing. I have so much deep purpose, but it's not a great responsibility I have that to manage people's life savings, everything they've worked hard for. Mm -hmm. You know, I have most of my clients don't make a financial decision without my approval first. That's an extreme weight. Forgot to tell you I bought a golf cart yesterday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I'm exactly. serious. Yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, Holly's company. I gotta, bought it. Yeah. Oopsies. Yeah, I'm gonna write that down. Oh, no. I'm in trouble. Um, we'll just do that like, right here on the yeah. show. But I, I tell people, I'm your personal CFO. Every financial decision you make, I'm, I'm, I'm a part of, you know, mm. and then that's a big weight. But, you know, there's nothing that gives you deep purpose without that great responsibility. I mean, you're tattooing something that's going to live on someone's body forever. Well, no, you know? no, no, just till they die. <laughs> or until they get, I guess, removed. But, um, right. or that. but that's a big responsibility, <laughs> it you is. know. It is. It, and it, it, it's sort of that uh, weird dichotomy where it's like, it's so meaningful and so meaningless yeah. simultaneously. Yeah. You know, I say that genuinely because I've had artists who have been stifled by the, they lacked the ability to see the meaninglessness of it. And they became completely identified with the being the tattoo artist. Mm. And, I, and I've gotten in trouble for this. I've been like, you know, when I see a, an artist just, you know, and this is a beautiful thing when they're so stressed out about it has to be perfect, it has to be perfect. And I'll always be like, dude, they're just tattoos. Who gives a fuck? Yeah. You know, I'm joking a little, but I'm illustrating a bigger philosophical point, which is get up in the morning, do your best, and then let go of it. Yeah. And it's never going to be good enough to your standards, but that's the best you had yesterday. And in that state, you get fluid and relaxed. And in, and in that way, you're more productive. You know, no, so. no, and, and I and I have to take that with my job. It's every day. I was day. thinking of you because you're managing people's personal wealth. Your decisions could affect their children going to what college or not going to college. I mean, that's right. a, but actually make, way more than what I do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I but I have to tell myself I'm making the best decision. I have the best intentions. I'm very educated. I have a, a tremendous amount of experience, and I take all of that every day, and I make the best choice possible. And I do have to let it go. At the end of the day. Yeah. But I don't always. That's why I meditate like hell, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Trust me. I don't have that one mastered. I just know it exists and that's the goal. Yeah. When um, people say, oh, you're meditate, you're sound healer. My God, you must be so zen. I'm like, I'm actually nuts. <laughs> and I, But if I, you know, I'd be really crazy if I didn't do all those things, you know? Right. That's just yeah. keeping the animal <laughs> yeah, exactly. from getting out of the cage. <laughs> exactly. That's cool. Well, you know, I have to, you know, with all of your expertise and all of your education, I mean, this is a little off the, you know, what we're talking about now, but what's your take on the current economy, U.S. economy? Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting time. I'll just preface this by saying, you know, and I don't fully understand this, but COVID shook the boat. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. Everything, money flowed this way, money flowed that way, loans were given this way, yeah. this way, all this money just moved everywhere. And now it's all, I want to say, simmered down to some degree. And we're seeing the inflation. We're what I'll just say what we're seeing, what we have seen in my business, you know, service industry businesses, people have been a little tighter with their money than they were um during COVID and right after COVID. People were spending like bananas during that whole time frame. Uh, I think it was just uh people needed an outlet, one, and two, a lot of money was shoved from the government to people. And it and even though it was money they should have saved, when you get a check from the government, it feels like free money. Yeah. You know, you're not gonna save that check. It's like, fuck yeah, two grand. Let's go get some tattoos. Yeah. You know, so and now that sort of burnt itself out. All that money's been spent. Mm -hmm. This is just my take. Yeah. And now we're where we are at. And I'd like to know your your take on all that and what 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 you see moving ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we're a consumption-based economy, the U.S. is. I mean, it drives 80% of our GDP, our gross domestic product, and will always be that way. So it doesn't surprise me that that's how most Americans reacted now, just like 
why the rich get richer. What did the rich do? They got PPP loans. They're reinvested in their businesses. They invested in the stock market. They saved, you know. So I, it doesn't surprise me what mm -hmm. happened there. You know, I think every because of the internet, because of social media, you know, everyone's talking, getting their news off of Instagram. It's just so easy to access, right? Mm -hmm. That it always feels like, it's never been worse than right now. Mm -hmm. There have absolutely been things that have happened throughout the course of American history that have been Way just worse. as traumatic. We've had a you know a president be assassinated. Okay, mm -hmm. um, we had nine eleven. Um, there has been multiple economic booms and busts and inf big you know inflation and interest rates at fifteen percent. And it's actually not the worst it's ever been in terms mm -hmm. of in different in different ways, you know, now we did have interest rates move as, as its fastest rate ever. So that's, that's, um, and that had a ripple effect across markets. But I think going forward, America, you know, America's resilient. We are the best economy in this world. You know, there are checks and balances. Mm -hmm. I think the best that you can do is be diversified with where you have your revenue streams, where you have your investments, that you have some emergency reserves. You know, they've looked at stock market, Democratic president, Republican president, Democratic house. You know, it it all like really doesn't matter. Mm. You know, it really doesn't matter, you know. Mm. And so all you can control is yourself. And that's back to a spiritual approach to it. You know, when I do financial planning for my clients, I have to plan for, you know, the stock market possibly losing half of its value. I don't want to tell my clients, you can't go on vacation with your family this year because the stock market is down 20 percent. We plan for that possibility and they still go. You know, that's freedom. That's wealth. Mm -hmm. The freedom to do what you want when you want. And that's what we're planning for. So I think, you know, don't get too caught up in the crisis du jour you know, the crisis of the day and where the economy may be going. You you do have a lot of control over your habits and how where you choose to put your money that insulate you from those things that you really have no control over. Agreed. That's my view on it. I agree with that. Yeah, it's not it's not so bad out there. And when you look at the uh, what what has happened just in America over the last hundred years, this is it, it's not that bad. You know, right. people bitching about the interest. And you're right. In the 80s, I think it was up to 15 percent. Everyone is worried about the stock market correcting, but the economy has to slow down. We kind of have to get into a recession for all that to shake. You know, it's I always tell my clients, good news, bad news. The economy is doing really strong. So the Fed's not going to cut interest rates right. right now. Right. Yeah. You know, oh, unemployment is still really low. But so inflation is going to continue to be high as mm -hmm. we have these demands on the economy. So, you know, we can't have our cake and eat it too. You know, it's right. it's hard. Or we get in a situation where we were in a low inflation environment, a low interest rate environment, and this is where what we got from mm -hmm. that, right? That it, that that good time happened too fast. It's it's all a yin and a yang in a cycle of life. You, you know, I I guess we could put a spiritual spin on everything happening in this world because it all in 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 investment terms they call it reversion to the mean. Everything comes back to the average. Well, what I hear you saying is it's all very normal and it's easy for this stuff to be sensationalized. Right. Especially, right, if you're not a true student of economics and you're just kind of watching your Instagram and trying to develop an opinion on where America's headed and the loudest voices prevail. You know, right. I, I I would agree with you 100 percent. I would agree with you on the woke movement. You know, I have like my my dad is just like, can you believe it's like it's like he's saying, um, well, not him, dad, sorry, people, <laughs> you know, like. The whole world is is losing their minds. And I'm just like, is it really that many people? Or is that just what pops up on your Facebook feed? You know? Yeah. Uh, it's easy to to fall into that. Um, the extremists have easier access to a voice and a platform. Yeah. That, that, and that's more true. motivation to talk. I've never posted a single thing in my life that was negative. You know? And most yeah. of the people I know that are going somewhere in life, they don't do that either. So who is at home with all that yeah. time to, to talk all that shit online, you, yeah, know? Yeah. you know, check the source, you know? So that's good to hear. And I, and I was hoping you'd say that because I, I just feel the same way. I don't have your education or any of that, but it just feels that way to me. So what you're really saying, I think, what I'm reading between the lines here is buy Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Never mind that it you know, lost half of its value before, mm -hmm. you, you know. Yeah, that's a whole nother but, you know, story. I was obviously joking, but... 
How, how do you feel about cryptocurrency? Whenever my clients say I want to buy not as a crypto. No, not as an investment, because oh. I think I, I think I would know your answer, which is yeah. we're going to do a well-rounded portfolio yeah. that doesn't Boring include shit. that yeah. doesn't include <laughs> crazy shit like like yeah, cryptocurrency. Yeah. But I yeah. just meant more philosophically, because the idea of what they're doing kind of has. Some I believe sense. in blockchain technology. There you go. Right, okay. the blockchain technology absolutely continues to have a value. Cryptocurrency as a actual form of currency that would be widely accepted around the world, I feel like has a long time to go. You know, mm. why with the volatility that Bitcoin and crypto experiences, why would you sell a house? that's worth $2 million and exchange it for Bitcoin with the possibility that tomorrow it could lose half of its value, right? Mm -hmm. You'd rather use the stable US dollar. Now, I know everyone has their concerns about the US dollar and the you know, government printing money and all those things, but it's still much more stable than yeah. what Bitcoin has done. Yeah. And so crypto as a whole, I think, may have prevalence in the future, but not anytime soon. I mean, technically we're all the U.S. dollar is crypto. I mean, how many people actually pay with hard money nowadays? It's all numbers on a on your phone it's or on the, it's all digital anyway. So digital currency is right. is here, you know. But to your point, I agree with you. The difference would be blockchain versus the U.S. dollar is not blockchain, right? right? So it can be manipulated. It can be fraudulent, and that's the idea, at least, that uh, in a blockchain setting, that theoretically gets removed. It's one hundred percent right. transparent. It can't be tweaked or toyed with. It's stored on millions of hard drives around the planet, and you'd have to destroy all of those hard drives to to wipe it out. Yeah. It's an interesting, yeah, I agree with you that blockchain seems to be, there's something there. Right. I mean, there's, you know, when people are using it for data storage, I mean, things on the cloud, you know, that's all, in essence, blockchain technology. Yeah, there's absolute mm -hmm. prevalence that that independence of storing data and being able to share data you know, seamlessly mm. absolutely has value. On that note, talking about kind of wild, futuristic, well, not, I don't know why I said that because this isn't wild and it's not futuristic, but AI, yeah. um, and it's, what impact do you see that having in your world? AI is getting its boom now, but it's been utilized in, in different ways for I know, 20 plus years, right? It's it, But it's becoming more, accessible to common people, right? To, to the rest of us. How it affects my world is, you know, from an efficiency standpoint, how I run my practice, it would affect just like any other business, right? The ability to have information sorted to, you know, for, for example, how I use AI in my business now is whenever I have a Zoom call, you know, a virtual meeting with clients, I'm able to have that conversation transcribed and bullet pointed and mm -hmm. organized in a way that is, easy to capture the highlight points of, you know, other than that, I'd have to transcribe what the conversation I had, then write an email, you know, so that saves time. Mm -hmm. So from an efficiency standpoint, in terms of investments, maybe for those robo advisors, you know, you know, where you're you're hiring a financial advisor, they're able to give you more personalized advice because now you can ask it a question and it can output an answer that's more custom. But you know, that will never take the place of me as a person, right? P when robo-advisors came out or AI is coming out, it's, oh, you know, that's going to do away with the value you have as an advisor. Nothing can, I don't think there's any competition for the level of experience and education that and perspective that I have. Of, you know, we talked about my upbringing. We've talked, you know, my 18 years of experience. Then I have too many letters after my name that, you know, there's nothing, there's no AI tool that that will supersede that knowledge. I don't know if I agree on all that, but one thing I will say you bring to it that I don't see AI ever bringing to it, and that is your um, your soul, your yeah. that spiritual aspect that you bring, that intuitive aspect, that ability to sit there and listen to a married couple and really sense on a deep level some of the potholes and the thing, you, you know, I don't, I don't know how AI gets there. And then knowing the right words to use for them versus them and, yeah. and coaching people to become more wise about how they approach money. Like, I don't know about AI doing that, but on all those practical tasks, I mean, it's, God, it's just going to be, I mean, 10X in two years. Well, so, I think uh, AI, do people need to be concerned about their jobs? You know, I have a client, 
son. Well, that's where I was going to go next is the labor market and AI. Right. And, and, do I have a, I have a client son now that does video editing mm -hmm. and he's saying that AI is essentially making his job, you know, obsolete now because you could just plug it in and the, there's AI software that does it for many of his clients for free or whatever cheap subscription. So absolutely. I mean, I think we all need to be mindful about our value, right? And and what we offer this world and how easily it can be replaced by AI. And then you got to pivot. You got to pivot. Yeah. 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 I agree with that. I think it's going to be a pretty interesting two years to five years. I mean, because this stuff is, is ramping up so quickly and getting smarter so fast. It's going to be very entertaining. And uh, I don't think any of us ultimately know where that goes. I mean, it's a difficult thing to predict what AI, AI will be doing in 10 years. Well, there's... um. God, there's a book that's just come out that said the author who's been studying AI for, I don't know, 40 years or something like that. He says by 2045 that we will all be part AI, that there'll be some sort of chip installed in, inside of us that we will become smarter humans because we have access, internal access mm. to to internal chat GPT, so mm -hmm. to speak. So I think we as humans will learn to, I mean, we're all here, we're all trying to survive. So I think to, the goal is to make sure the robots don't overtake us, but we then merge with the robots, right. I guess is the key. Yeah. No. And you know, it's, it, I'm just saying, I mean, that, that all those things you just said may or may not happen, but they're cer it's certainly feasible to say that the thing you just said could be very prevalent in just five years, 10 years for sure. I mean, anybody, anybody that, um, is a scientist or whatever could extrapolate the growth rate and tell you that's so in other words it's not like we're talking about some in a hundred years no we're no. talking like soon it'll it's exponential you know yeah like 10 to 20 years yeah it's crazy man yeah. I, I i love it i love the subject i love um thinking about it i mean i, I grew up loving sci-fi and i just feel like i'm in a sci-fi movie at this yeah. point you know <laughs> But there are practical uh, implications, and, and a big one, I think, is you're right, the labor market. And really being honest with yourself about what you do for a living, what value you bring to others, and how much of that, if you you know kind of look at what chat GPT and these large language models do, how much of what you do is probably going to be replaced and then some kind of you know pivot. Yeah. Yeah. People got to take that seriously. Absolutely. Some people got to take that very seriously. I have a friend who owns a law firm up in Los Angeles, and I think he was telling me in the next two years, they're going to um, be letting go 80% of all the paralegals wow. for sure. And um, it'll all be done. You know, they, they, yeah, a paralegal, they'll, a person will sue somebody. They'll send the law firm a 20 page document outlining all, everything that happened. A paralegal has to sit there, read 20 pages. And out of that 20 pages, he's like, only about a paragraph is applicable that we can actually take into this lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So there's the paralegal, just like, this is all just emotional bullshit. Oh, right here, that, that guy broke a law. We need to note that. Yeah. AI is doing that now. He doesn't yeah. have to do it. They don't have to do it anymore. In my, in my field, we have a tax planning software. So before, I'd have to get my clients' tax returns and read all and just try to find things that, you know, that might be wrong or I could save them on taxes or whatnot. Now there's a software that take the whole tax return and then give me the highlights of everything mm -hmm. and what I should be looking for. That mm -hmm. that takes hours out of my day. But that, you know, just like your your partner, his job is not going to become absolute, obsolete because his ability to strategize, you know, right. and, and the same thing with my job. So we, we all have to learn. I mean, we've been doing it is learning how to leverage technology in mm -hmm. a way that makes us more efficient and the things that we're really good at valuable. You know, I talk about soul success, building sustainable success and soul alignment, right? Soul alignment is having a career in soul that's aligned with your soul is where your passions and your strengths align with the contributions and, and needs of this world, right? So you have to always be searching for that. And I think those opportunities will always exist. I do. Uh, there, if you're out there in a position where you're like, shit, like my job's completely replaceable. Just know that there is somewhere for you. Like do, you know, get quiet, listen to your heart. Right. Breathe. 
Think about the things you enjoy. Think about the things that turn you on. Think about the things that you're passionate about. And then think about the needs of your community and the people around you. What is the, my dad always told me, find a need and fill it. The bigger the need, the larger the financial reward, you know, you know, so there's all sorts of needs still out there. So I, I'm just saying that to, I know there's a lot of people very nervous about this yeah. whole thing, you know, and, um, but there's always going to be something for you out there. Wow. You're cool. Thank you. You are very cool. And I'm, I, too. I'm stoked that you're my financial wealth advisor. <laughs> um, we just got going, but I, uh, I don't know. I think I'm going to be in a far better place in five years knowing you than I am today. And I'm doing okay, but you now I'd like to create more wealth. I'd like to be able to, to, to help more people, to be a better father, to, to enjoy my life to its fullest. I told you this earlier, but when I started my spiritual journey, which I don't know, it was probably late high, uh, getting out of high school, reading a lot of Buddhism. And I, in my early years, associated wealth with evil. You know, mm -hmm. like I'm not going to, I just subconsciously saw myself as a person who would not have a lot. One of the reasons I became a tattoo artist is because I was very comfortable in that space. My, you know, people around me are like, oh, you know, this is 33 years ago. You're going to be a tattoo artist. So you're cool. Like never really being, have enough money to raise a family or have a home. And I, my yeah. answer to them was like, yeah, I am. Cause I don't see myself having wealth anyway. Why would I want to be an evil person? But over the years, I've realized that wealth and abundance is a, is a gift that you can, you can share with others that you can use just to, to support people around you and uh, the people you love. And it's absolutely deserving. We're all deserving of that. And it's mm -hmm. there for all of us, especially here in America, in the West. Yeah. I mean, it's there and anybody wants it can have it. And, uh, but I do think like anything in life, if you wanted to be really, really fit, you get a trainer, you know, you, you, there are professional people like yourself that can really fast track that process. And I should have started this long time ago, but whatever today's today. And here yeah. we are. You have plenty of time. Well, you know, I, there's Buddhist proverbs, it's something like hold everything, hold nothing, right? You know, this idea that I need to have a minimalist lifestyle, then I'm not of this world and I'm not attached to these things. You know, there's a lot of people, I'm going to go live on a compound commune and, you know, not be attached to these earthly things, then I can reach spiritual alignment. And it's actually the ability to have all those things, but be completely detached to the outcome mm. is you know, true enlightenment and spiritual growth. And so when people hear that I, you know, love meditation and I'm a sound healer in my spare time, you know, like, oh, is she really a good wealth advisor? And and for me, that's why I am such a great wealth advisor. You know, mm -hmm. one, I, I have a true purpose. It's not just a job for me. You know, I, I really care. But I focus more on the life that you're trying to create and not just chasing beating the index or a number or whatever, because you're always going to want more. Mm. You, we could, you know, I could be up 10% in a client's portfolio and they're like, but why didn't I get 15%, you mm -hmm. know? I, it, but it's, it, we're, all, we're always, it's natural to want more. But if that 10% gets you to all your girls are in college, you're taking vacations with your family, is that enough? Mm. You know? And so I lead with that type of mindset. And I think, that gives the ease to what I do and and the ease in your life, right? Because a lot of the reason why, you know, you're saying, oh, you know, I, I should have should have got started on this path sooner is always throughout this time in the back of your mind, you're like, I haven't been thinking about these things. I, mean, yeah, I haven't been thinking about these things, you know, and what I bring to clients is the peace of mind so that they can be present for their families because we've had that conversation. We've thought about those things. You know, I, I am your personal trainer for your finances. I tell you what you got to eat, when you have to work out. <laughs> and as long as you do those things, you'll look like Chris Hemsworth. You know, your balance sheet will look like Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, sl slow, slow habits. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I know there's a lot of people who don't want to meet with a wealth advisor because they know they're going to have to um, make adjustments that might be uncomfortable. But going through this process with you, I didn't realize how much actually more comfortable I feel like I I'm I feel more peace of mind knowing I'm now doing these things whereas before there was this little shadow part of me that always kind of knew like you're not doing your money yeah. right dude and it would just kind of you know so there's a lot of, of peace in there so yeah I, yeah get in there and do it you're gonna feel better it's just like anything else it hurts to go to the gym but 
you feel a hell of a lot better, you know, especially after it's been a few months and you just feel better because you've been doing the work. Right. Well, let's close with this. I don't know why I thought this question, I was writing some notes today and I wanted to ask you this. What would be your perfect day? What would be my perfect day? Mm. This is a, t- I mean, hey, look, first of all, obviously you probably couldn't do everything in the world in one day. Yeah. So it's just a hypothetical, but what would be like a beautiful- uh, The older I get, the the simpler yeah. those things become. You know, my perfect day would be waking up with no alarm clock. <laughs> but I, I usually, you do. It's like, yeah, as you get older, your internal clock works better. But waking up, you know, around 6 a.m., I've been really loving this brain tap device um, who you should have on your podcast. He's amazing. It's a meditation tool that okay. does auricular therapy. So light therapy in the ears and the eyes mm. while you're listening to a guided meditation. So I've been De- doing that. Definitely. Let's talk after the show. Yeah. I'm in. And I, I do a 10 to 20 minute meditation with that. And are you still in bed when you do it? No, I get up you and get and, up. Yeah. Go to a place yeah. you have or you, yeah, you couch. sit. It depends. If I'm doing breath work, I sit mm-hmm. and then I go into a workout. So mm-hmm. I love to move my body, give thanks to my body, spend time with my son, spend time with my husband, mm-hmm. be outside in nature, mm-hmm. have a glass of wine eventually. But my perfect day is just the ability to be present and alive and enjoy the simple things. Mm. Well put. I think you just described my perfect day. Yeah. Except I get up at seven, not six. Oh, yeah. Oh, but, you know, slacker. <laughs> <laughs> that is a beautiful day. You're right. I mean, a lot of people answer that question with my the perfect day. I'm on a private jet. I'm going to uh, Dubai. And yeah. we're good, me and my friends are going to this place, this concert. You know, it's like that. I mean, that's fine too. But I am 52 years old, and that would that would describe a perfect day for me too. It doesn't yeah. have to be fireworks and cannons going off. Just no. that. Yeah, I and mean, that's how when I when I when I got into my relationship with Landon, it was so easy. I kind of questioned it at first because when we're young, we think love is passionate and. You know, there's fights and then there's makeup sex and then, there, you know, there's all these explosions and it's exciting and, and it was so easy. Yeah. It's too easy, oddly yeah. easy. <laughs> um, and I thought, wow, this is real love when you can just be at ease with someone, you mm-hmm. know, and, and that's real life and living is when you can just be happy with not much flair, you know? Yeah, um, that's true. That's true. And if you're seeking the, those, those highs, I would call them, they're, they're, they're followed by lows, yeah. you know, and that's, that's the pro. And I'm, I am, uh, that's when I younger years, that's the kind of guy I was always going for the biggest emotion, the biggest feeling hit enough valleys and starting to even out. Now The even keel is where I'm yeah. shooting for nowadays. Well put. That's beautiful. Thank that's you. beautiful. Thank you, Sathya, for you. all the help you've given me personally, for all the help that you provide for all your clients, and for the inspiration of your personal story. Just knowing you has made my life better. I have a lot harder time griping and whining about things, knowing you. I really do. It's one thing to hear these stories on the news or in school, but you know, when you have a friend who's really been through something like that, it's, you know, I think of you often. I'm like, oh, just you. right, right when I'm ready to be like, that, that, wait a minute, that's not a real problem. <laughs> and that's it. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> so you are an inspiration to thank me. You. And you, you are, I know, going to be an inspiration to everybody who listens to this episode. So thank you for all that. The world is a better place with you in it. Oh. I love your husband. I love you guys. I love your family. Hey, everybody, just want to take a moment and give a huge shout out to my sponsor, Sullen Clothing. If you're a fan of tattoo art and art in general, they make some of the coolest t-shirts, hoodies, and hats with some of the best art from some of the best tattoo artists in the world. Check them out, sullenclothing.com. Ryan, Jeremy, good friends of mine. Thank you for your support. And now back to the show. How can people find you? My company website is Arise Private Wealth, R-A-R-I-S-E, privatewealth.com. We have an Instagram, Arise Private Wealth. I also have my sound healing Instagram is Heart of Ananda, which means bliss in Sanskrit. And mm-hmm. then my Instagram, my personal is Sathya underscore Arise, PW.com. Perfect. Perfect, people. Yeah. If you want to get a little tighter handle on your money, give her a call. Hit her up. She can do that for you. 
and maybe teach you a little bit of a soul alignment along the way. So, <laughs> all right, let's end this with a nice namaste. Oh, namaste. Namaste. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. See you on the next one. Peace out.